Let's bring in our first guest for the hour. We've got Paul Schatz, president of Heritage Capital. And Paul, uh, you heard Jared kind of giving us a state of play. The bar is high going into earnings season. Uh, we're going to get a little more into the big banks with our next guest. But give me a sense of how you're, see th you're seeing things shape up as we look ahead to tomorrow. I think earnings are certainly priced for perfection. It, it's, it, you couldn't argue that. We've seen you know, meteoric rise in stock prices. And, I, and the pause we had for six weeks in the market, I thought the fundamentals were trying to play catch up with price, but clearly you've got an awful lot of stocks at or close to all time highs, lofty expectations. I've, in 32 years doing this, I've, one thing I've said consistently, and that is it's not so much what the news is, what the earnings report is, what the inflation report is, What's more important is how stocks react, how the markets react. So, you know, tomorrow we have JP Morgan, which we own. If JP Morgan blows our earnings to the upside, as they've done in the past, but the stock can't move and you actually see sellers come in, you'll have analysts upgrading the stock, but the, the action will be poor. You want to see either a poor report and stock go up. You don't want to see great news and see stocks go down. That's just a sign of a, certainly of a tired market like we saw with technology uh, a few months ago. One of the things that um, stood out in your notes, Paul, today is you said you've been looking for a peak by Labor Day from which the biggest decline since last September occurs. I mean, that seems like a red flag that we're seeing uh, two months down the line here. What is it that stands out to you? I mean, what, what are you seeing that leads you to think that there could be a big correction coming? So I know that that statement probably seems a lot more ominous than it is, because don't forget, since last September, we haven't even seen a 10% decline. Last October, into the October 30 low, it was just upper single digits. So a couple of things. Number one is you're in the second year of a new bull market. What happens in the second year of a new bull market? Volatility. You have some periods where volatility spikes. You'll get some kind of pullback. You usually see a double digit decline in year two of a bull market. In January, when I first made the forecast, I said, you're going to have a peak somewhere in the summer. And from that peak, you'll go down 7 to 11%. I still believe that's the case. Again, just because stocks have gone up doesn't mean that the bull market's going to end. But in year two, you have this, it, it, it's, a, it's a cyclical call. And it's also seasonally in year two of a new bull market, as well as year one of a new president, you get this summer peak. We see some pretty intense sector growth. Jared talks about it all the time. You know, we came in today. It was it didn't look good for the cyclical stocks. You know, the, the Nasdaq was running, the S and P was trailing. Since then, they've come up and, and trading somewhat evenly. You're seeing some vicious rotation these days, growth versus value, some great tug of wars, and a lot of folks have spoken about the average S and P stock being down. I think eight nine percent already. Usually, doesn't mean always, but usually right before you get the actual market going down, you'll see the individual names going down and the market's being held up by those super large cap names. You guys mention them all the time, the FANG stock plus a few more. So it wouldn't be bad because the longer term numbers look super for the S&P, but it wouldn't be bad to lop off 7 to 11% from a peak this summer. And then you can go back and buy with both hands and both feet again. So, so it sounds like the decline that you're anticipating in September is sort of part of this natural cycle that you see. With that said, how do you think investors should be allocating their portfolio? Well, this bull market has glossed over so many unbelievable mistakes that investors have made. Every time you have a run, I say this over and over and over again, forget about what your stocks are. Market doesn't care what you paid, what you sell it at. If you like and love what you own, then hold on to it through a pullback and you'll be fine on the other side. If you've got something like this morning, we sold iHeartMedia. I didn't love it anymore. And I said, you know what? I'm not willing to sit through it going down 10 to 20%. If you don't love what you own and you've had a good run in the market, it's a good time to either raise some cash and prune or rotate into things that you do want to own. There's nothing wrong with taking chips off the table, 
in some issues, whether you've lost a little money, made some money, and you can either deploy it right away or wait for whatever sector or index or stock you own to come into your buy zone. There's nothing wrong with that. And if the market runs away from you a little bit, it's okay. People should never be in a hurry to lose money. It shouldn't be so greedy that they can't afford to have or can't stand to have a few 10% in cash. So I tell investors, make sure you love what you own because probably some kind of battle weakness is coming. And that's when it kind of tests our investing metal. Uh, Paul, let me finally ask you, we've had a number of guests on who, who've said that they are putting just a little, just a little money aside in crypto as a defensive play. Uh, we had Rick Edelman on a few weeks ago who said at least 1%, 1 to 2% is kind of the starting point. Where do you stand in that? And when you consider the downside that could potentially be coming, is that something that investors should consider? I knew you were going to ask about crypto at some point because <laughs> I've been with your colleagues before and I love the discussion. So first of all, as, a, as an investment advisor, I don't know any other traditional investment advisors who have found a way to invest in crypto on behalf of their clients directly. So that's one. Rick Edelman, certainly well-respected. I don't know that he's doing it directly for clients. Most of us have said to our clients, you know, put one to 5% in crypto. My view is, and I said this when, in the upper, when it was in the upper 50,000s 50, with, uh, with some of your colleagues, let's wait. I think it's going to shake out. We're, we now came down to 30,000. We're bouncing in a range Longer term, yes, I, there's nothing wrong with having one to 5% of your assets in crypto. It is absolutely not defensive. That is a risk on asset. Just because it doesn't correlate, meaning it doesn't dance with the stock market, doesn't mean it's defensive. That is a super duper aggressive, it, it feels like a hyper leveraged asset. But I, mm. I at least the, the numbers that I look at says that sometime this year, you're going to get Bitcoin well below 30,000. You'll have some kind of washout. That's when I would say, if you didn't own any, you could start to take a small position. But to me, it's not dumping. A ton. I've heard people dumping 50 to 80% in crypto. <laughs> to me, that's absurd. And it's, it's certainly not what a fiduciary would do. Yeah, some word of caution there. Uh, Paul, it's always good to talk to you. Paul Schatz, you president too. Thanks for of having me. Heritage Capital.